All right, so let's go ahead and get started here this morning. So what I wanted to do today was just give you an overall basic intro to the circuit world, okay? Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about the circuit world. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation that our producers have, and that's because we as veterinarians have had little to no training on cervids when we were being trained in veterinary school. So the, the producers have relied upon themselves, and that um, leads to some confusion, to some bad decisions, and to financial loss. So my goal in the cervid industry has always been to educate other veterinarians and producers on medicine and surgery, basic concepts that we should all understand. So as we start out here, one of the things I think that's really important for everyone to know is that when we say cervid, it encompasses a lot. Right, it's not just white-tailed deer or elk. It's also cica, red deer, fallow deer, on down the line. So there is a lot of different types of cervids, shall we say. <clears throat> cervids are part of the ruminant family. One of the other things that we as veterinarians and producers have a challenge with is that there's not a lot of research that's been done with cervids. Has there been research done? Yes. But if you compare the amount of research that's been done with cervids to say what's been done with poultry or with bovine, it's a drop in the bucket, okay? So we take a lot of what we know of other species and some common sense and then try to apply that to the cervids themselves. So why are people in cervid farming? What is the purpose of it? The purpose of it is here in the US, the hunting industry, okay? That is not the same as what's in other countries. In the US, what drives it is the white-tailed deer without a doubt. Getting this guy to a hunting preserve uh, where someone will have the opportunity and pay for the opportunity to hunt in that preserve is what drives the market for us. When you look within the industry itself, cervid producers buy and sell animals to others, okay? So you've got shooter bucks. So somebody is raising them and then selling them to a hunting preserve. You have the actual genetically superior does and fawns that one farm produces, they are selling it to another farm. Then we have meat production in the US, which is actually very small. Uh, we were having a discussion about this before we started this morning. One of the things that most people don't realize is that the US is the largest importer of venison in the world. We consume more venison and we import more venison than any other country in the world. Yet, all of that venison comes to us from New Zealand. And it's because we do not have the pathway set up for USDA inspection of these animals for it to then be distributed out into the market. So that's one of the avenues that we would really like to be able to change from the cervid side of it, is being able to produce the venison here in the U.S. that we actually consume versus importing it from the other side of the world. Then we have the specialty products. And all of these things generate income from hides to antlers urines and then crafts. When I say crafts, you know, a lot of people are thinking, what the heck are we talking about? How many people have ever seen a knife that has a handle that's from an antler, right? That is a craft. And a lot of these actual end products, right, they shed these antlers every year. Not every shed is worthwhile of going on somebody's wall once they're there. So they sell it by the pound and it brings a pretty good profit margin for them. The other thing would be urine. I work with several urine production facilities. In the state of Pennsylvania alone, these guys are producing $3 million worth of urine a year. So why is urine a big deal? How many hunters do we have in the US that don't actually go to say a hunting preserve, right? But they go out to state game lands. What are they using? Scent. So, where do we get the scent from? It comes from doe urine. So it is very much a big industry. If you look at Cabela's or Walmart or any of the Bass Pro Shops, they all have scent there. That's deer urine that came from somebody's farm. So it's very much a, uh, an economic driven industry without a doubt. This is a slide that was actually produced in 2007. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was based on the USDA access census at that time period. Even though it's dated information, I really still like to have this because it gives everyone the ability to look at the state that you're in and see how you compare to other states as far as number of cervid farms. 
This has changed dramatically in some states since 2007 to where we are now in 18. One of the biggest changes is Alabama. And Alabama had 81 farms in 2007. Now it has close to 500. So that has been a dramatic increase. I don't know if New York, I don't actually know how it has changed. If you guys have more than 150 farms now, I think that you do and that number has grown dramatically. Uh, places like Texas and Pennsylvania, which have always been the two largest states, have stayed about status quo. PA is still somewhere around 1,000 or 1,200 at this point. Texas is around, still around 1,300, so they haven't changed much. One of the things I think that's really interesting and everybody should pick up on is that you can see there's almost a dividing line right up through the middle of the U.S. The majority of servant farms are on this side, and they're not on the western the reason is that CWD has been much more of a predominant uh, disease that was endemic in the Western states for a long time. So nobody wanted to move towards establishing a farm in a CWD you know, endemic state. So now that has changed. Uh, CWD is, as we all know, very much a uh, hot topic of conversation, both politically and from the medicine side, in my opinion, and we now all have to deal with it. <clears throat> it's not just located in Western states at this point. So when we look across the nation, let's try to put this into perspective. And this is 2007 numbers. In 2007, there was uh, roughly almost 8,000 servant farms in the US, okay? There was about 2,600 hunting preserves where the animals would be harvested from it generated a $3 billion a year business. Now, think about that for a minute. $3 billion a year business on roughly 10,000 farms. And at this point, we had about 500,000 servants that were being raised. If you have a $3 billion a year business off of 500,000 animals, how valuable is each animal? Very valuable, right? And these producers were attempting to raise them and manage them with little veterinary oversight or input. Why? Because we didn't have training on them. And one of the hardest things for any veterinarian to do is step outside of their comfort zone, without a doubt. It doesn't matter if we're looking at a surgery that we have never done before, right? Or a complicated case that we feel is beyond our capability, we like to do what? Refer to specialists. Well, how many specialists are there in service in the U.S.? There's about five, I'm one of them, okay? And I do not have time, nor the actual willpower to be everyone's veterinarian, you know, in the United States. So I've been trying to get veterinarians involved in this for the past 15 years. You guys have a great education. You can do medicine, you can do surgery. Guess what? You can do servid medicine and surgery and consulting, without a doubt. The other thing that's really, beneficial to the agricultural industry from the cervid side is that it generates profit for the producer. On the 2007 numbers, the average income that was generated was $53,000 on cervid farms, okay? We have a lot of cervid farms that generate over $200,000 a year or a million dollars a year. But when you look at it, break it down, the average is having $53,000 in direct sales or annual sales per year. Look at the land requirements. 31% of servant farms in the US are less than nine acres, okay? 21% are less than 19 acres. So that means that over 50% of the servant farms in the US are less than 20 acres or 19 acres. But we're still generating $53,000 a year in annual sales. That's pretty cool. How many other agricultural industries do you know that you can have a small amount of land and still generate a good income? The other thing to think about with this is what types of land do we actually want to use for a servant farm? Does it have to be rich farmland? You know, nice, flat, open pastures? The answer is no. The best servant farm in the world with pastures and fenced in pens is a rocky hillside. They will thrive there. They will do wonderful there. So you don't have to have land that could be used for other agricultural purposes, raising corn and wheat and other forages or grains. You want to use the marginal lands that would not be considered great 
for agricultural industries as far as raising grains or forages. Use the rocky hillsides, use the swampy bottoms. They will thrive, they will do great there. This is a slide that's specifically set up to PA, my home state, so I was able to get this information. And what I wanted to do, once again, this was 2007 numbers. In 2007, PA generated 40, about $42 million worth of uh, income from service, deer and elk specifically. Compared that to what sheep and goats did in that same year. Sheep and goats were about 6 million. When we went to vet school, did we all learn about sheep and goats? Yes, we did. They only generated $6 million in 2007, yet in Pennsylvania in 2007, we had over about $45 million. Why aren't we taught about servants? Because none of our professors had any training on servants, right? We have a lot of people that are board certified in sheep and goat medicine, you know, or small ruminants. How many people are board certified in servants? Nobody. Can you get board certified in servants? No, there's not that specialty there. So again, this is a great, way to say we as veterinarians need to step outside of our comfort zone and start to provide veterinary medicine to these producers. They are in need of it, without a doubt. I have this picture here for two reasons. The first is to show you what we are attempting to do in the U.S. We are attempting to raise a trophy animal, okay, in a short amount of time. Uh, this buck right here is he's absolutely just a perfect, beautiful buck. I think that guy, when he scored, he scored somewhere around 230 to 260 was his actual score, okay? Now, he's only a two-year-old animal. How long would it take to achieve that in the wild? You'd probably be looking at a five to seven-year-old buck. How many bucks make it to five to seven years old in the wild? They don't, okay? So we're producing an end product that is desired by the consumer. The consumer wants a trophy animal and they're willing to pay for the right to hunt in an area where there's a trophy animal. The other thing that I have up here is the fence right behind the actual buck itself. This is not what the hunter sees. These deer are raised in pens from an acre, you know, to five acres. But when they are released into a hunting preserve, how big is the hunting preserve? It's bigger than an acre, right? Most of the hunting preserves can be, multi, you know, several hundred acres. Uh, there's a couple of farms that I work with that they have 2,000 acres that is fenced in. So when the hunter is brought into the actual hunting preserve, they still have to hunt the animal. It is not a canned hunt where they drive up, the corn feeder is there, and they shoot the animal. They still have to hunt. When the consumer purchases the hunt, they put up half of their money. They then go to the hunting preserve and they hunt the animal. Once they have actually harvested the animal, they pay their other half. There's no guarantees you are going to get the animal. If the hunter does not actually slaughter the animal or harvest the animal, they get to come back next year. They don't get their money back. So it's still very much you have to hunt these animals. But this is the end product that we can produce. How are we able to produce this in such a quick amount of time? We've been able to do it through genetics, nutrition, and veterinary medicine. That's how we've been able to achieve this. There is no steroids, there is no growth hormones that are used within the cervid industry. Everything is back to nutrition, husbandry, and veterinary medicine. Now, how easy is it to keep this guy alive? Not that easy, okay? It's a challenge. How easy is it to keep this guy from goring this guy in rut? It's not easy. So it is definitely a challenging industry for the producers and raising these animals is not as easy as raising sheep and goats or beef cattle or dairy cattle. This is a picture that's here. Um, this was a trade show that I was at. This was the North American Deer Farmers Association. And this was one particular servant farm and this was their booth. What they were doing was actually advertising their genetics. They wanted to sell their genetics, i.e. frozen semen or embryos, to other cervid farms. So everybody that's up here on this wall is a very nice looking buck, without a doubt. And they were able to achieve these racks. What I think is really interesting is that all of these bucks, these five bucks here that are actually hung on the wall are still at home, alive, producing semen. Because they shed their racks every year. 
So they take the rack setter shed and then actually mount it on an inferior box that was slaughtered so that you can advertise your product without having to kill your product. So it, it's a good thing to be able to do in a way of actually saying, this is how nice you know our bucks look. So all of the data that I just presented to you was gathered in 2007. Nobody's done a really nice uh, compilation of information since then. And it was Texas A&M that did this and got most of this information together. Since 2007, the industry has continued to grow. We are now estimated at 750,000. So we've increased by about 200,000 animals that are being raised in the US since 2007, which is a great thing. Why do we continue to grow? There's a demand. If there wasn't a demand for the end product, we wouldn't continue to grow as an industry. Uh, when you look at just the amount of urine that is produced and the demand for urine every year to go out to other hunters, it's, it, it's mind boggling. The TDA, which stands for the Texas Deer Association in 2007 had five sales, okay, where they have five sales throughout the year where people will show up within the industry, right? And then they buy cervids or genetic stock from each other. From the five sales, the TDA generated $5.2 million in sales. That's one state organization alone. And that's just what went through the actual sale podium. That's not everything that happened on the side with one guy just selling directly to another one. That's everything that went through the auction block. So it is a very viable economic industry. You can make money in it. Producers can lose money in it. How do they lose money? Disease. Okay, hands down, and not treating it as a business. Uh, for a long time, as veterinarians, we have realized that if you have bovine respiratory disease, your producers are gonna lose money, okay? Uh, does Newcastle disease cause a lot of problems for chickens and loss of money? Yes, it does, okay? We have realized that as veterinarians, and we've worked with our producers to try to limit those diseases. We need to do the exact same thing in the cervid industry. And that comes down to farm management. How do we actually manage these animals? While they are ruminants, while medicine is medicine and surgery is surgery, handling these animals uh, is a different story. It, it is definitely different than other small ruminants. So what are the common diseases of white-tailed deer? Well, the first one that I have up on the slide here is CWD because it is very, very prevalent in today's cervid world. The next one that I have is EHD, epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Then we have capture myopathy, pneumonia. There's many different pathogens that are associated with pneumonia. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Clostridials, parasites, and rabies. If you look at this, pneumonia, clostridial, parasite, and rabies. Did we all learn about these in vets? Yes, we did. Can we take that same knowledge that we learned and apply it to cervids? Yes, we can. Okay, so you've got a great education. Veterinarians have a great education. We just need to step outside of our comfort zone. In 2003, uh, Dr. Jason Brooks from Penn State did a, a great research project. And he's a pathologist there at uh, Penn State. And what he did was he looked at the deer that came across his necropsy cable from 2000 to 2003, did a retrospective study. And this was the top nine things that he saw that caused disease, or rather not disease, diseases that led to death in cervids. The number one up here is pneumonia, without a doubt. Pneumonia is the number one killer of white-tailed deer. Again, we'll come back to that. But on his list, he then had enterocolitis, malnutrition, trauma, gastrointestinal parasitism, uh, cellulitis, degenerative myopathy, luminal acidosis, and, the, and nephritis. Now, this was from Pennsylvania, okay? Remember, how many states do we have that raise cervids? A lot, but you can look at trends here. One of the things that I think is very interesting that's on this list is malnutrition. Why would malnutrition be so high on a cause of death in cervid farms? Is it because we don't understand how to feed deer? Do we not know how to actually provide nutrition to them? Are the producers themselves lazy? Are they cheap and they're starving all of the animals? The answer to all of those questions is no. The main reason that malnutrition was so high on the list is because cervids, what mostly came across his necropsy cable would have been fawns, okay? Fawns have zero body reserves. 
I'm going to repeat that again. Fawns have zero body reserve. So if you have a fawn that gets a gastrointestinal disease or if they get a respiratory disease, those animals stop eating. What do they die of? Dehydration and malnutrition. The disease does not kill them. The disease process actually causes them to stop eating. They have no body reserves, so they end up expiring because they starve to death because they did not eat. So that's why malnutrition is so high from the fawns. When you look at the malnutrition, say, okay, well, let's look at adult animals. Cervids are incredibly resilient animals. They live a really long time with the disease before they die. So they can have chronic pneumonia for months and they waste away to nothing. So once again, malnutrition would be very high on the list of what caused this animal to die. But the malnutrition again was caused by a disease process that they stopped eating. Not because we can't feed deer, we know how to feed deer. We do know how to do that. It's keeping them from getting a disease process that then leads them to stop eating. My own field experience, what are the top three killers of white-tailed deer? Number one is stress, number two is pneumonia, number three is trauma. These are the three top killers of white-tailed deer. Pneumonia is number two because pneumonia is brought about by a stressful event. We have these animals that even though they've been raised in captivity, right, their genetic line has been raised in captivity for the past 30 years. Are they a domesticated animal? And the answer is absolutely no, they are not. We are taking an animal that would normally range anywhere from two miles to 10 miles, okay, out in the wild, and we are confining them to an acre pen, sometimes even a half acre pen. The stress level that is placed on those animals is high. Even though they've, they've learned to live in this, right, their stress level is still high. When we have stressed animals, what happens to their immune system? it gets suppressed. So a stressful event can lead to immunosuppression, which then leads to pneumonia. So that happens very often. So when a producer will handle their animals, um, secondary pneumonia, post handling is a very common thing. So it's, stress is one of the number one killers of white-tailed deer. So what do we need to do? We need to train our clients to keep stress to a minimum, work quietly and slowly, be prepared and instruct your clients to be prepared. One of the worst things in the world is when a veterinarian shows up to do TB and brucellosis testing and you're gonna run the animals through the chute, okay, to, to do this. When was the last time these animals were through the chute? Six, six months ago, never. What's the stress level that's placed on those animals when they do that? Incredibly high, okay? We're asking them to do something that they are unfamiliar with. One of the worst stressful situations I ever saw on a cervid farm, we were gonna TB and brucellosis test a herd. The farm was very laid out, all of the pens um, opened into an alleyway, and then the alleyway came down to the handling facility. We opened the gate. That gate had not been open for six months. There were several people trying to push the animals to go through the gate. They would run up to where the gate was normally shut, they would stop dead, they would turn around and they would run back because they had not been through that gate for six months. I finally called a halt that day and said, no, we are not doing this. Your animals are too worked up. If we continue to do this, it's gonna be a bad deal. So how do we overcome that? Well, guess what? It's very simple. You pick a pen and you leave the gate open for a week at a time and let them wander in and out. So it's not a stressful situation when you open the gate, first of all, or when they go down the alley, or when they go through the handling system, okay? It's not a hard thing to do. It's just instructing our clients to work with the known problems. So when we've been talking about diseases, we have a lot of producers that want to vaccinate, right? And, and the ultimate question is, do these cervid producers have to vaccinate? And the answer is no, okay? We, we can't vaccinate for every pathogen that's out there. What you really have to do is work with your client and determine what's causing them to have financial losses, okay? There's no point vaccinating deer for BBD. Why? BBD is not a primary pathogen for cervids. Yet we have a lot of producers that will use cattle vaccines that, in, that have BBD as part of it. We don't need to do this. 
okay? We need to have veterinarians that have an understanding of the common pathogens and then know what is actually causing the cervid producers to lose money. So this is an important slide. This is an incredibly important slide because this is the major players as far as pathogens go in the cervid world that cause economic loss. First one up there is Fusobacterium. That is the primary reason that cervid producers lose money for a pathogen is Fusobacterium. What does Fusobacterium cause in the cervid world? Lumpy jaw. Is that the same pathogen that causes lumpy jaw in cattle? No, it's different, okay? I have an entire lecture just set up for lumpy jaw itself. Viverstenia, relatively new pathogen that's been around, uh, definitely causes issues in the cervid world. Clostridium type A, diarrhea, very quick death in fawns. Generally don't even see the fawns that are affected by this. You don't even get to see uh, an actual diarrhea episode. They just contract the disease and die very quickly. E. coli, which is very common for other small ruminants. Truparella, pasturella, mycoplasma, and mycoplasma, again, I have another entire lecture that is just designated for mycoplasma because it is becoming such a devastating pathogen in the cervid world. We've been dealing with mycoplasma and mycoplasma bovis in the bovine world for multiple years now. Guess what? It is now part of the cervid world. And then of course, EHD and blue tongue. So these are what causes producers, these are the pathogens that cause producers to lose money. So how do we identify what's causing our producers to lose money? It's very simple, do diagnostics, okay? Do diagnostics. If we assume we know what the pathogens are, that's gonna to lead to poor management and financial loss. So at the end of the day, we need to do what they taught us to do in vet school, and that's take samples. You have an animal that has a diarrhea, fine. Find out what's causing it. You have a respiratory disease, great. Figure out the pathogen that's causing pneumonia in these animals. One of the hardest things that we as veterinarians can do, as I said before, was move out of our comfort zone, right? I work with vets every day, that is my job. A veterinarian calls me with a problem. We then go through what samples they need to take, how to submit them, and then once we get an actual diagnosis of the pathogen, we can start to make management changes. We as veterinarians don't always know what samples to take. In vet school, we were taught, you know, diagnostics are a really good thing to do. And one of the first things we think about with diagnostics is blood work. Well, blood work is great, right? but actually blood work's not gonna tell us what the pathogens are. So do you have the appropriate swabs? Do you know how to take those swabs? Do you know how to submit those swabs? And then what lab do you submit them to? All of these things on my side are very simple because I deal with this on a daily basis. But for practicing veterinarians that don't have that immediate knowledge base, they're somewhat hesitant to take samples at times. But if you don't take samples, you're not gonna know what the pathogen is, and that is actually poor veterinary medicine. So good management is limiting disease. Vaccination is part of management, but vaccination does not replace management by any sense of the word, as we all know. So what we have done in the past is we've tried to take commercial vaccines that have been designed for cattle and then apply them to the cervix world. Okay, I did this when I was in practice. Sometimes it was successful, sometimes it wasn't. Um, it just depended on what actual disease you were dealing with. And when I was in practice, I was just as bad as everybody else. I didn't submit a lot of samples. I didn't. I've learned now from being on the other side of the fence, shall we say, working in a diagnostic laboratory, that how important it actually is and how beneficial having that information can be. Again, on the left here is the major players, right? These are the diseases that cause financial loss in the cervid world. On the right is what cervid producers vaccinate with. Most cervid producers, if you say, do you vaccinate? And they say, yes. And you say, okay, well, what are you vaccinating with? They'll say, I'm using Covexinate or Alpha-7, something along those lines. Covexinate and Alpha-7 are fantastic vaccines, okay? They're vaccines against clostridial disease. But look at what's on the right and look at what's on the left. Is anything on the left covered by what's on the right? And the answer is no. So while for many, many years, we've been vaccinating with clostridial disease and doing a great job at preventing Chauvii and septicum and those sorts, they're not really that important in the cervical world. So education, 
doing the diagnostic sampling, figuring out what's actually causing disease in the herds, and then coming up with an appropriate vaccination program. Again, I have this exact same slide here. Why do I have it for the third time? Because that's how important it is. Everybody that is in this room today or sees this recording at some point in time, this is it. This is what causes disease in the cervid world, and you should know these. Okay? Your producers that you're working with should know this. Unfortunately, many of them don't. They do not, so we need to educate them. All of the major players can affect any cervid herd. Okay? It doesn't matter where you are in the U.S. Some herds are much more at risk than other herds. In New York, the amount of EHD outbreaks we have are few and far between. Okay? If you lived in Louisiana or Texas, EHD is endemic and it's there every year from February until the end of November. So depending on where you are, okay, in the US can affect which of these major players that you, you really do need to focus on. If you're going to vaccinate any cervid, um, you have to remember they are just like any other species that we work with. No vaccine, whether you're using one that Newport made or a commercial one, none of them are 100%. One of the big things we always have to remember <coughs> is that for the vaccine to be effective, the immune system must not be depressed. So what is one of the big things that affects the immune system in cervids? Stress. So if you're going to have a vaccination program and you do all this legwork, and you find a vaccine that fits your producer's needs, and then if they do a poor job at handling the animals, and they're incredibly stressed when you actually vaccinate them, how well is your vaccine gonna work? Not very well. So you have to take all of the different aspects of cervid management into account when we come up with the vaccination program. When you vaccinate, give two doses, okay? We don't really have any modified lives where we can use a single dose in the cervid world. Everything's going to be two doses, so we do need to give everything two doses. All of the animals should be vaccinated. Either cows or does should be vaccinated and then boosted six to eight weeks before calving or fawning. We want to try to get as much colostral protection as we can to either the calf or to the fawn. And then we generally will vaccinate the calves and fawns at weaning. But there is in the last slide, I said that all of your animals should be vaccinated, but there is one cervid that should not be vaccinated. There is one particular animal that you do not want to vaccinate. And that animal is a buck that is going to the shooting preserve. Okay? We don't want to vaccinate that animal before it goes to the shooting preserve because what is the meat and hold on that animal? We don't have any established guidelines. We do not have any established guidelines. There are only two products that have established meat withhold guidelines in the U.S. for cervids. One of them is Safeguard, the dewormer. The other one is Anised, which is a particular type or brand of xylazine. Those are the only two products that have established meat withholds. Everything else, it's not there. Now, we can do Farad, okay, and, and make a relatively good decision. My recommendation is generally 90 days. Okay, 90 days. So if you're gonna vaccinate a buck and send it to the honey preserve, cool. Make sure it's at least 90 days before it's actually going to be harvested. If you come up with a vaccination program, is it gonna solve all of the problems? No, it's not. Management is the key factor. Management, management, management. The other thing we have to remember is, is that you can have a great vaccination program and you can have uh, a good program for managing stress to vaccinate these animals with but if the level of antibodies that is produced by the vaccine actually gets below the environmental pathogen load, you tip, right? And even though you're vaccinated, you're still gonna see disease outbreaks. What causes the environmental pathogen loads to go high with most of these diseases? Confinement, confinement. Remember, we have an animal that would be roaming over two miles to 10 miles that we have now put in a half an acre to an acre pen or maybe a five acre pen, but how many other animals are in there with them, okay? What you need to do is really think about feedlot medicine, and I have that mentioned somewhere in another slide. When you're looking at cervids and pen cervids, think feedlot medicine. It's the same mentality, because we have a high number of animals and a small space. So think, think along those lines when you're thinking about diseases. So what does Newport Labs do? Um, we don't have a commercial vaccine, but we're able to come up and work with the USDA through non-adjacents 
non, they're, they're non adjacent form that we're able to create vaccines in house and then the veterinarians can get them through the USDA non adjacent forms. Okay, so we can make specific products for an individual cervid farm or you can use the ones that we have available. We have a combination vaccine, a straight viral, and a straight vector. So what's in the combo? Well, the primary pathogens. As many as I thought was actually beneficial to put into one vaccine. So EHD and blue tongue, Fusobacterium, Clostridium type A, Pasteurella, Truparella, and Viverstenia. That's what's in the combo vaccine. What's the straight viral? Just the EHD at this point. And then the Bactrin, uh, would be the Fuso, Clostridium type A, Pasteurella, Viverstenia, Truparella, and then E. coli. For all intents and purposes for the state of New York, since EHD is such a relatively low incident rate compared to other parts of the country, when veterinarians call me and say, what do you think I should use? I say, well, for most of your producers, a Bactrin of this sort would probably be the wisest choice for them as far as how much money are they putting into it, and then what benefit are they going to get out of it? I've mentioned EHD several times. It's something that we as veterinarians should all be familiar with. Okay, if it doesn't show up on your back door all the time, you may not be familiar with it. So I thought I'd take a few moments to go through it. This is what we know about EHD. This is a relatively old pathogen that's had very little research done on it. Uh, we have our first reports of EHD, it was 1967 or 68, I think in New Jersey was the first reported, okay? Um, we know it's caused by epizootic hemorrhagic diseases caused by epizootic hemorrhagic disease virus. We know that that particular virus is an orbivirus, it's a double-stranded RNA virus, and it causes disease in wild and domestic animals, okay? EHD is a known pathogen in beef, okay? In beef cattle and dairy cattle. It just has very minimal effects. Since it has minimal effects on those, we didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Small ruminants though, i.e. deer in this case, it's a devastating disease. It's transmitted by culicoides or biting midges. So an animal has to be bit by a midge that has a high enough viral load in that particular midge to actually cause clinical disease in the cervix. You see EHD in September, maybe the end of August, September, and October. EHD is present before then, but it takes that long for the virus to ramp up to high enough titer levels in the actual midge, titer is not a good word, but levels in the midge for them to cause a bite and then be infective to the cervix, which is why we always see it at the tail end of summer. It has this ramp up effect where the virus is being multiplied because they're biting cattle that are carrying it and it continues to get to higher and higher levels in the cattle or other deer and then they bite a naive deer and then they get the disease. There are seven different types of EHD worldwide. EHD causes problems in other parts of the world too. I actually have eight listed here but number eight has been reclassified as the same as a type three or a combination virus at this point. So in the literature now, it says there are seven types of EHD have been found. In the US to date, we have found EHDs type one, type two, and type six. That's it. I'm grateful that that is the only three types of EHD that we have found to date. When you have a producer, that suspects EHD and they work with their veterinarian, most labs can do a test for EHD, but all they're doing is looking for the presence of EHD, yes or no. They will not be able, they're doing a PCR. They're not able to actually tell you what type of EHD it is. To be able to figure out what type of EHD is actually affecting those animals, whether it's one, two, or six, or another one that hasn't shown up yet, you actually have to do viral isolation and then be able to sequence viral protein number two, which is on the surface. That tells you what type of EHD is actually affecting the animals. So with EHD, there are three forms of the disease. You have paracute, acute, and then chronic. Paracute is the stories that we've all heard that my pen of deer were fine yesterday, and then I came out and I had multiple animals that were dead. They may see some hemorrhaging or blood coming from the eyes or areas of bruising, there may be some blood that's actually running out of the nose. Um, that's the paracute form. 
what most people deal with and try to treat is the acute form of the disease. The acute, with the clinical signs, you have a swollen tongue, they're foaming or dueling because they're having difficulty swallowing, ataxia, weakness, rough hair coat, or just kind of ADR. Those are the ones that we see and try to actually treat. The chronic ones are the animals that have lived through the actual viremia and the damage that the virus causes, and now they're dealing with the aftermath. Uh, chronic animals, pneumonia is incredibly high. Uh, laminitis or foundering is very high. Uh, digestion is generally a problem, so enteritis is an issue. The virus is a wicked, wicked virus. It's a very short-lived virus in the animal itself, but the, the damage that it causes to the endothelial cells of both the digestive system, the respiratory system, and the vascular system is very high, okay? It is a wicked, wicked, wicked virus. So how do we treat this? So for the, the acute ones, what we're trying to do is control inflammation. So steroids, that's what we do. High doses of steroids. Uh, a typical treatment of what I would recommend for a, say a 200 pound buck would be 50 milligrams of dexamethasone for multiple days. So we're talking high levels of steroids and then antibiotics at the same time. The antibiotics are not there to do anything for the virus. The antibiotics there are to prevent or hopefully limit a secondary pneumonia from happening because their immune system is gonna be so suppressed from the virus itself. Supportive care, uh, fluids, trying to get temperature control. And then the last thing for treatment is if you see animals that are affected, tell your producers to get a shovel, dig a hole, because you're gonna need it. It's sad to say, I'm being flippant, but it's the truth. The majority of animals that are affected by this are going to die. It's a bad deal. So this leads us back into vaccinating because we can vaccinate free HD, okay? But again, depending on where you live, you need to have a conversation with your producer and figure out what needs to be part of their vaccination program. If you're gonna have a bare minimum, do a CD&T, okay? That's my bare minimum for any cervid herd is a CD&T. After that, figure out what the major players are that's causing them financial loss, and then try to find a vaccine that will suit their needs. When we look at all of the vaccines, whether it's a commercial vaccine or a vaccine that Newport has made, there's a lot of debate on whether or not you should vaccinate pregnant does. Okay. And this is coming as not from veterinarians, but from producers, because they don't want to A, handle their animals when they're pregnant, and B, they're worried about causing an abortion. If it's a killed vaccine, vaccinate the doe. Vaccinate, with them, vaccinate them when they're pregnant, okay? Let's try to get as much good antibodies in the colostrum to protect that fawn as we can. So when we vaccinate, we want to vaccinate the does, but then when do we vaccinate fawns? Because veterinarians are going to get the question a lot of times, when do I vaccinate my fawns? Well, I generally back recommend that if it's a bottle fed, okay, and that's these animals, the, the fawns that are being raised by hand, uh, you can start vaccinating them at six to eight weeks of age. Pretty easy to do. And you can give them their multiple vaccines. The other ones that are pen raised, vaccinate them at weaning. A lot of producers are gonna say, well, can I vaccinate at birth? What are we doing at vaccinating at birth? We, when I went to vet school, I was taught, don't vaccinate early, don't vaccinate at birth. Because of maternal interference of antibodies, you're getting a, in essence, just wasting the producer's money. We're starting to change that with ruminant species and we're vaccinating early and earlier, both with killed bacterias, with modified lives, with a lot of different things. So I recommend that if the producer is going to vaccinate, when they catch and tag the fawns, great. But be aware of what it's going to do and what not, what it's not going to do. It's not the same thing as vaccinating a fawn that its immune system has developed more fully. You know, at say six to eight weeks of age or 12 weeks of age, it's not the same thing. So if they're going to vaccinate, great. But be aware that this is not a, not, not a once and done thing. They're still going to need to mul vaccinate multiple times later in life is the best way to approach that. So remember, every farm has individual needs. Get a detailed history of the farm and then choose a product that's going to work. Now, we talked about the major players. What about rabies? 
okay? Is rabies a big deal in surgeons? Is it something that we as veterinarians need to be concerned about? Well, this, as uh, everybody here is, a is aware of, we get rabies reports, okay, for the state that we live in, and then what was actually positive. This is a rabies report from 2010 when I was still in private practice in Pennsylvania. This is the area of where I was southeast Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, and Chester County. And you can see that we had six animals that were positive for rabies in 2010. <clears throat> this was two separate farms that were about a mile away from each other, and it happened at about the same time. Uh, it began with one animal that was drooling and was somewhat aggressive. And I, I didn't know what it was. I was called out to treat the animal. I treated the animal. The producer was standing there with me when we treated the animal. We picked up the animal. We moved the animal. Did we have protective gear on? No, we did not. The animal died. I sent it for necropsy. Glad I did. Tested positive for rabies. I had to get post-exposure boosted, right? The producer themselves had to get the post-exposure shots, as we all know is not inexpensive. He had two other animals that popped up with clinical signs that were the same. We just euthanized them immediately, and they both tested positive. Another farm down the road about two weeks later also had uh, three cases that popped up. With, hit, with, hit, with those, they were not aggressive. They were not drooling. All three of those, for whatever reason, are neurologic. So you can have multiple manifestations of rabies, but rabies definitely does affect cervids. Rabies vaccination is not that expensive. So if you have expensive animals, your producer has expensive animals, it's not a bad idea to get them vaccinated for rabies. Now the next question is, do we have any rabies vaccines that are labeled for cervids? No, we don't. So as a private practitioner, I would just recommend that they would get the large animal and use that to the best of their abilities. Parasites. What parasites affect cervids? Because parasitism is definitely an issue. Remember, we have animals that are normally free ranging, right? And we've got them confined to a very small animal, very small area. So when you think parasites and deer, think goats. Pretty much everyone out there, every parasite out there loves to live in a cervid. You know, that's pretty much the whole list of them from strong giles all the way down to liver flukes. The other thing to think about and be very aware of, especially in fawn barns, is crypto. Crypto can be devastating, just like it can be in calves, okay, dairy calves or beef calves. <clears throat> in fawns, remember, they have zero body reserves, so you can have a fawn that's affected by crypto and they are going to die. And remember how crypto lives in the environment for such a long period of time that uh, it, they can be effective from one year to the next year. The other thing to think about is coccidia. Deer definitely have a problem with coccidia. So the normal imeria that we were all taught in vet school is something that can definitely affect them. But there's another coccidia that if you're not aware of it, if you're not looking for it, you will miss it. It's imeria zajacae. It is a coccidia that was first found in wild deer and it is now part of captive deer as well. The difference between it and regular imeria is that it's about half the size. So if you have yourself that's doing a fecal or a technician that's really good at doing fecals, if they don't know to look for this imeria that's half the normal size, they will miss it. It's just bigger than crypto. You can just see it on a bright field microscope, so you need to be looking for it. The good news is, is that it does respond to other normal coccidia treatments, albon, different things of that nature, corid. So we can control it, but if you don't know it's there, you're not going to treat for it. So how do we do our parasite diagnostics? How we do for every other species, right? You can do an in-house fecal. You can send out for cultures. Uh, it's not a hard thing to do. When we send out for fecal cultures, uh, we need to keep in mind Salmonella, E. coli, Clostridium, and then asking them to look for crypto as well. So what parasitic drugs do we use in the cervid world? Guess what? Same ones we use in the cattle world. Okay, we don't have anything specifically designed. So ivermectin or ivermectin plus. Uh, if you don't have liver flukes as part of the problem in your world, use a mectin of some sort and don't worry about treating the liver flukes. Long range uh, was a drug that came out in 2012. It has a very long duration of immunity, uh, 
duration of immunity. And it has a very long duration of effectiveness. It's been very successfully used in survey worlds. Okay, so it's something to think about because in the survey world, they could, you could have a farm that needs to be dewormed a monthly. Do we want to touch them every month? No. So an extended release product may be something that would be a benefit. Um, I talked about treating coccidia. The main treatments for coccidia would be Corid, Albon, and then Marquis. Okay? We do have some resistant populations of coccidia in the cervid world that they don't respond very nicely to Corid or Albon. So we've had to look outside of the box. And I have Marquis up here, was, which is Panazarol. There's a lot of farms that will also use Totrazarol, which is uh, commonly known as Baycox, which is a coccidia treatment for pigs. But it also works very well in cervids. So with ivermectin, there are some things that we need to be aware of when we're using these drugs in cervids. One of the things that we've had a problem with is in, in other small ruminants is ivermectin resistance, okay? So what have we tended to do is increase the level of ivermectin that we give to the small ruminants that we treat with. We need to be very aware of ivermectin toxicity in cervids because it is there and it definitely happens. Um, one of the worst situations that I was involved with was when, still in private practice, one of my producers called me and said, uh, Doc, I, I handled my fawns this morning and dewormed them, and they're all laying around on the ground flopping right now. What did I do? I said, Chris, I'm on my way. So I drove out there. He ran 30 fawns through the chute. Excuse me. He ran 30 fawns through the chute. They all weighed about 20 pounds. And he gave them all a cc and a half of ivermectin orally. Why did he do that? Was Chris stupid? No, Chris was not stupid. Chris was going off of information that other producers had given to him versus calling me for advice. He called other producers. So we had ivermectin toxicity. Out of those 30 fawns, we lost 22. So was that a devastating loss for him? Yes, it was. Education is important. So ivermectin toxicity is very real. I use ivermectin, I use it successfully, go with the cattle dosage, which is in essence one cc per 100 pounds or a tenth of a cc per 10 pounds. It'll work very nicely. I spoke about long range, it's the same deal, it's a good product, think about using it if it's appropriate. Corid, when we're treating coccidia, one of the big things with Corid is it will cause them to not want to eat or drink for a day or so. So use it with caution. Um, they are susceptible to it as far as the negative side effects. So we definitely need to think about that. Anorexia and neurologic symptoms are listed as negative side effects for cattle when being treated with it. Cervids are sensitive, okay, without a doubt. Works well, um, and especially works well because you can treat a whole pen at one time by isolating their water source and then mixing the cord in and treating them with the appropriate dosage. What's the appropriate dose? Well, the cattle dose. It'll work very nice. Albon, um, great drug, great, great drug. We have to always worry with the sulfa drugs at wiping out the normal flora, and that will definitely happen. If you go above the cattle dose, you will treat the coccidia, but now you have an animal that is blowing pipe stream diarrhea because we have wiped out their normal flora. So don't overdose in this case at all. Marquee, I love using Marquee for coccidia. Works really, really, really well. Is it off-label? About as far as off-label as you can get, okay? Because we're taking a tube of Marquee and then we're mixing it with a water suspension and then treating them. Works very well. Okay, but make sure as a veterinarian, you have your reasons of why you're doing this and you can justify that if anybody asks you, why are you using Marquis? You can come up and explain to them why you're using this particular product in this fashion. So what are our deworming recommendations? Most cervid farms are gonna need to be a minimum deworming of two times a year. Okay, that's most cervid farms. What's the best thing to do? Do fecals and then deworm. Pretty common sense, right? Get random fecals, three or four samples from each pen, um, have a fecal analysis done, and then make the decisions based on that information as to whether or not you actually need to deworm these animals. If they don't have a high parasite load, don't deworm them. Don't spend the money, 
don't, don't go there. The other thing is find a dewormer and stick with it. Uh, when I went to vet school, we were taught that rotation of dewormers was the smart thing to do. Uh, we're learning now that was not the smart thing to do and that drives more resistance. So find a dewormer that works and then stick with it until you are no longer seeing the effects that you want and then switch to a different dewormer. Salmonella and E. coli. There's a lot of different E. coli's. When we look at the E. coli's that generally affect cervids, E. fawns is what I'm talking about now, most of the E. coli's are not the E. coli's that we as veterinarians were taught about, K99, okay? Most of the E. coli's that affect fawns are non-hemolytic E. coli's that we don't know much about. So oftentimes, if you have a truly bad E. coli problem, if you can isolate the E. coli that's actually causing the problem, you can make a custom-made vaccine and it can be very effective for it. Salmonella, once it shows up on a farm, it's just like with the dairy or with the beef operation, it pretty much becomes endemic, okay? And you can have different uh, clinical manifestations of salmonella, whether it's septicemia, acute enteritis, or subacute enteritis, or chronic enteritis. But just remember that once salmonella shows up, it needs to be on your radar. It's not going to magically go away. The other thing we need to think about with cervids, especially fawns, is Rota A. Okay, Rota A is definitely a problem in fawns. And when we went to vet school, we were all taught about oh, Rota and Corona, right? Rota A and Corona, we were all taught about that. One of the things we weren't taught though, is that there is different types of Rota A that is out there and that can affect not just cervids, but <coughs> other ruminants as well. In 2015, I was contacted by a veterinarian uh, and I was working for Newport Labs at this point. They had uh, 16 of 34 fawns died from an enteric disease. <coughs> All of the fawns had the typical classic signs of viral disease and then secondary bacterial infections. When we actually figured out what was going on, we figured out that it was a Rota A that was causing it. But it's hard to see from where you are. The Rota A, we did a viral isolation on it, and then we actually sequenced it to determine what type of Rota it is. It was G10P11, which is classically known as the human Rota A virus, or what affects human children, okay? And when we compared it to what is in the commercial cattle products, it's about 30% different as far as the actual virus itself. So one of the things that we're not taught in vet school is that we know that Rota A affects ruminants, right? But we're generally always taught, and we don't even hear the term G6P5. That is the classic Rota A that affects, that we know about, that affects ruminants and that we can vaccinate for. The problem is, is that look at all these different types of Rota A that are out there. Rota A doesn't care if you're a ruminant, a human, a pig, an avian. It wants to set up shop and cause problems. So again, diagnostics can help you determine, is there a commercial product that I can use to limit this disease, or do I need to take steps to make a specific one? So Rota A is definitely something we need to know about. A uh, few minutes about reproductive facts. So when do we generally breed those? About a year and a half of age. Some does we will breed as fawns if they are large enough. So fawns are generally born, you know, May, June, somewhere in that time period, okay? If they are big enough by December, we can actually breed them and get a fawn out of them the following year. But most does we're gonna breed at about a year and a half of age. Now they can have a reproductive life cycle that lasts a long time. There's many does out there that are 15, 16 years old and still popping fawns out every year. The natural breeding season, or the rut, takes place from November to January. Generally with farmed animals, we're trying to breed them as early in the rut as possible. So most cervid producers are gonna breed at the end of October to the beginning of November. Why? Fawns are born early. When they're born early, they have a higher weaning weight. Okay, it's the same thing as when you look at cattle. So if we can get them born early, we can get a higher weaning weight, which will then carry on to their actual size of the rack as they continue on through their productive life cycle. What's the normal gestational period for a cervid or for a white-tailed deer specifically? It's 187 to 220 days. Most of them are going to bang out and fawn at 
190 to 198 days. If you have a doe that is beyond 222 days, they've got the wrong breeding range when they actually fawn out. Most of them are between that 190 to 198. We do have problems with dystocias. Uh, we do need to do C-sections at times. The other thing to remember is that most producers, if there's a problem with a dystocia, they're not going to be able to handle it. Okay, they're not going to be able to handle it. So we as veterinarians need to provide that service. One of the main things to remember is, is that you need to be able to work on the dough. How are you going to work on the dough? You can't do this in the chute. Okay, she cannot be awake to do this because the stress levels are going to be way too high. So we have to chemically immobilize or anesthetize these animals. The big thing to remember, reverse the fawn. As soon as you get the fawn out, if the fawn's alive, reverse that fawn immediately. Generally, we're gonna use some sort of alpha-2 in the chemical immobilization, so you need to reverse that alpha-2 immediately as soon as that fawn hits the ground, or else the fawn's gonna end up dying. So, what are some of the common breeding practices? Well, we do transvaginal AI, laparoscopic AI, natural breedings or embryo transfers. That's a picture of me doing laparoscopic insemination. Uh, why do we do laparoscopic insemination? Well, when you look at the average cost of a straw of semen that's, that's really good, really hot genetically, you want to try to split that semen straw as many ways as possible between recipient does. A good straw of semen for a cervid will range anywhere from $1,000 a straw to $10,000 a straw. How much is a good, good straw of bull semen right now? 50 bucks. Right? So we've come up with these practices to try to take advantage of these good genetics as much as possible. Embryo transfer right now has become incredibly popular because uh, there are multiple states that are, have closed borders, right? That we can't ship deer out of or into, but those rules and regulations right now don't cover embryos. So you can have, there's many embryo farms that are in the Northeast that we breed these does, collect their embryos, and then those embryos are shipped down to Texas and Louisiana and places like that, and then put into recipient does there. It's a way of getting Northern genetics down into the South. So embryo transfer is very much uh, popular at this point. What about stocking density? I mentioned multiple times that we need to think about feedlot medicine. And this is something that is so basic that most people don't, don't understand or not aware of. Stocking density should be seven to 10 head per acre. Once you get above that number, your environmental pathogen load goes pretty darn high. And your losses due to disease are going to increase. The other thing that most people don't remember is that fawns count. You can have a pen of seven does, and after they fawn out, how many animals just increased in that pen? At least another 14. Okay, if, if they have triplets, that number can go up higher. So fawns count. And that's where we see a lot of the environmental pathogens causing devastating losses is in fawns. So stocking density is something that's very important. It's not uncommon to go and look at a pen and hey, there's 20 does in, in an acre pen. That's way too high. What happens when all their fawns come about? Okay, are these producers stupid? No, they're not, they haven't been educated. We have to educate them about this. So the handling facilities. Uh, I mentioned this earlier that with stress, we want to limit the amount of stress. If you have a handling facility, you need to train your animals to go through it, okay? They have to be trained and it needs to be a normal part of life and not something that happens once a year or once every six months. So why do we have a handling facility? Well, we wanna be able to put our hands on them and it be a low stress event. So what is the handling facility used for? TB and brucellosis testing. Number one, right, we do that. For annual vaccines or deworming, estrus control or breeding, illness exams, placing ear tags, microchips. So we use it quite a bit for multiple different things, but remember, they need to be trained to it. So the pictures that I have here are of several different shoots. The, uh, picture on your left, the blue shoot there, shows very nicely that when the animal comes into it, it's a V-shape, the animal actually walks into it. Once, they're, once they are in the chute, the floor drops out so that they drop down into the chute. 
you have to have their feet off the ground. If their feet are on the ground, they're going to continue to fight and jump. So they have to be suspended. The other reason I have this picture here is because I'm incredibly happy I am not the one who took that picture. When you look at that, that buck is incredibly stressed at the moment. That buck is very, very stressed. That is not what we want. When we are running animals through the chute, we have a time frame that we should do to them what needs to be done, and then they are out of the chute. My criteria is 45 seconds. They are in the chute for 45 seconds at the max. If you go beyond that, then your stress levels go up considerably, okay? So to achieve that goal of 45 seconds, what do we have to have? A plan. If you're gonna give multiple vaccines, if you're gonna TB and brucellosis test, you need to have multiple people there that have their own individual jobs. If you, the veterinarian, are there to do two TB and brucellosis testing, that's your only job. They say, doc, can you vaccinate while we're doing this? You know, can you give this antibiotic? Your answer is no, I will train someone to do that, but I need to focus on my job. And you need a time as the animals go through. You know, you need to actually have a time, timer going so that you can see, am I doing this appropriately or not? It's very achievable for 45 seconds. That's a long time to get a lot of things done when you have the appropriate number of staff to do it. So this is a uh, really nice cervid farm that I was at in Texas. The reason that I'm showing this picture, there are three things here that I want you to see. One, here's the feed tub. Two, here's the water. They're close to each other. Cervids are like any other species. You want the water and the feed to be next to each other because the more they drink, the more that they'll actually eat. The third thing that I want you to see in this picture is the shooting blind. This is a really, really smart idea that this cervid farm had. You actually enter the shooting blind from outside of the fence so that if you have an animal that you need to chemically immobilize, you can do it without being independent with them. You can be hidden. They can come up in their natural environment. They come up to eat and then you dart the animal. So it's a low stress event versus walking out in the middle of the field with the dart gun or trying to chase them down with a four-wheeler. There's ways to make darting a low stress event. This is a fawn barn in Texas. When you look at it, it's a fantastic fawn barn. What does it look like? A dog kennel. That's what fawn barn should be. Individual stalls with a floor that is a sealed concrete so that you can actually clean it with walls that are sealed so that we don't have crypto living from one year to another or coccidia that's being spread in the environment, okay? When you think about a fawn barn, you wanna think about a dog kennel. That's what you wanna think about. When you look at fawn, uh, one of the big things in a fawn barn is record keeping because when you're raising 150 fawns and you have three people that are feeding them and treating them, they're gonna remember everything that they did to each individual fawn. No, they're not, especially when they're feeding three to four times a day. So record keeping is incredibly important. What do fawns need as far as comfort? They need a rubber mat to lay on. That's it, they're happy. They don't have to have dirt to lay on. So a, a, a surface that has been sealed, a concrete surface that has been sealed is very good for them to be on. Uh, I don't have a picture of it in here, but the other thing that I love to see fawns raised on is tenderfoot, which is the same thing that we raise piglets on, right? then the urine and feces can go through and you can clean out underneath. They do great on tenderfoot. It's a wonderful thing that we've started to do in the cervid industry. You can see that there's a little bright light white right here and that's where they have a place to go out and they have outdoor runs. Again, think dog kennel where they can go outside, get sunshine, move around, but they are not just roaming with the entire other group because we want to expose them to each other in a limited basis because if one gets coccidia, we don't want it blowing through the entire barn, okay? So again, think dog kennel. When we think about biosecurity and management, one of the big things that we need to instruct our producers on is just basics. Clean the waterers, okay? Clean the stinking waterer, clean the buckets, clean the automatic waterers, clean the feed tubs. It's not hard to do, it's just they need to be educated on it. That is incredibly important to do. Our pens themselves, it would be ideal if we could rotate pastures, right? 
leave one pasture fallow for a year. That would be fantastic. Most people can't do that because they don't have that many pastures. They have more deer than they actually have room most of the time. So one of the things that we can at least do is drag the pastures quarterly. You know, let's try to break up the feces that's there and expose the parasites that are there to the sun and let the sun do its job. So it's not hard to do. The other thing we need to think about is not transferring pathogens from one pen to another pen or to the actual handling facilities. We can do that with foot baths, okay? We can do that with foot baths very easily. Recommend to your producers, you have a foot bath per pen. You step in the foot bath, you know, before you go in the pen and when you come out of the pen, clean up so you're not transferring one pathogen from a, one pen, from an adult pen to the fawn pen. Something to think about. We as veterinarians need to be incredibly conscious of this. We're all busy. Most vets that are going to be working with cervids are a mixed animal practitioner or a large animal practitioner of some sort. You really need to think, where have I been today before I am going to this cervid farm? And if you have been on a dairy farm, how about you have a new set of boots or a really, really clean set of boots and a clean set of coveralls before you go into that cervid farm? Okay, it's something that really needs to be thought about. So that's the end of this particular lecture. I tried to take and condense this down and give you a broad overview of what the cervid industry is like, what are our major pathogens, and a little bit about farm management. Uh, for anybody in this room or anybody that ever sees this lecture, if you have additional questions, please contact me. There's my cell phone number right there. There's my email address. Please feel free to contact me at any point in time and I will assist you in any way that I can. Thank you for your attention today. Thank <laughs> you.